Look, there's a lot of reasons why somebody with ADHD might want to avoid taking stimulant medications. They can be expensive. You might not always have access to them because of the frequent shortages. Some people can experience some unpleasant side effects such as insomnia. And a lot of people don't even have the opportunity to see if stimulant medications might be effective for them because getting diagnosed with ADHD as an adult is a and it's often really expensive. Because of these factors, there are a lot of people hunting for alternatives to stimulant medication for ADHD symptom relief. And as a registered dietitian, I am all aboard the food and lifestyle first train as long as that approach makes sense. Unfortunately, when it comes to nutritional supplements, the confidence and enthusiasm people have over their ability to heal or fix whatever health problem you're having almost always outpaces where the evidence stands. And that is because there is a lot of money to be made when it comes to supplement sales. That doesn't mean that all supplements supplements are ineffective. And so I scoured the internet to find all the supplements that are typically discussed when it comes to non-stimulant approaches to ADHD care and dove into the evidence behind those recommendations to figure out which supplements are worth the hype and which ones aren't. Now, before I dive in, I have to give the standard disclaimer that this is not medical advice. This video is for education and entertainment purposes only. A supplement that is safe for a general population may not be safe for you based on your specific lab work, medical history, and any medications you might be taking. And so before starting any supplement regimen, I highly recommend you have a quick chat with your doctor. Okie dokie. So let's put that list of nutritional supplements up on the board and start knocking these bad boys out one by one, starting with the broad category of mineral supplements. The first supplement that is very commonly recommended is iron. And the theory behind why iron can be beneficial for ADHD symptom management is that iron is a cofactor for the enzyme that produces dopamine. And so if you are low in iron, it will most likely impact your body's ability to make dopamine. There have been several studies looking at iron supplementation for children with ADHD who have low iron stores, but not anemia. And all of these studies show that there is some level of ADHD symptom improvement with iron supplementation. And I wanna be perfectly clear that this does not mean that iron deficiency causes ADHD because not everybody who has ADHD has low iron stores. And also when an iron deficiency is reversed, ADHD symptoms, while they may improve, don't actually go away. Rather, this means that if you have ADHD and an iron deficiency, that your symptoms may be worse than they would be if your iron levels were normal. So it might be worth getting your iron levels tested periodically. And specifically, if you were looking into lab testing, it's important to get your ferritin levels checked because this is assessing your body's stores of iron, not just the amount of iron that is transiently available in your blood. Now, lab testing is not always accessible to everybody because of cost and the time and effort involved. And so the question is, if you have ADHD, should you be supplementing iron just just in case? And the answer to that is a resounding no, because you absolutely can overdo it with iron supplementation, which can have negative health consequences. Even with appropriate iron supplementation, there can be some unpleasant side effects such as GI distress and constipation. And so when it comes to iron supplements, you really only want to be taking them if you actually need them. And so to summarize, based on the available evidence, yes, iron supplementation can be beneficial for ADHD symptoms if and only if you were low in iron to begin with. Now let's move on to the next mineral, which is zinc. Now the theory behind why zinc would work for ADHD symptoms is that zinc is involved in the regulation of dopamine. There have also been some studies that have shown that people with ADHD tend to have lower zinc levels than people who don't have ADHD. However, this meta-analysis pulled the results from several studies looking into this and concluded that there was no statistically significant difference in zinc levels between groups. And so it is unlikely both that low zinc levels contribute to the development of ADHD and also that there is something about ADHD physiology that might predispose somebody to zinc deficiency. But what does the research say about supplementing zinc when it comes to ADHD symptoms? Now the research on zinc supplementation and symptom improvement is a little bit more murky because there are very few studies looking at the effect of just zinc supplementation alone. Most of the studies are looking at the effect of zinc supplementation in conjunction with stimulant therapy or other nutrient therapies such as omega-3s. There is some evidence to suggest that when zinc zinc is provided with stimulant therapy that it may make the stimulant therapy more effective. For example, in this study, they provided participants with zinc while they were titrating their DEX therapy and found that in the zinc supplementation group, the required effective dose of DEX was 37% lower than they saw in the placebo group. However, it is unclear if only people with low levels of zinc to start with would actually see this benefit because a lot of the studies that show a benefit of zinc supplementation with stimulant therapy are done in countries where zinc deficiency is really common and many of these studies didn't test participants zinc levels. Additionally, there was one
one study that looked at zinc supplementation in conjunction with Ritalin therapy in participants who had normal zinc levels at baseline, and they found no benefit to the added zinc. This study looked at Ritalin therapy in conjunction with either zinc, omega-3, or a placebo, and found that all three groups, including the placebo group, saw a similar improvement in ADHD symptoms. And lastly, there is this study that looked at children who have ADHD and showed that there is a benefit in ADHD symptoms when zinc levels are brought up into the normal range. So overall, it does appear that if you have low zinc levels, it might worsen ADHD symptoms, and there's probably a benefit to bringing that level back into the normal range. But you kind of want to do that anyway. And so as with iron, it probably couldn't hurt to get your zinc levels tested, especially if you don't eat a lot of high zinc foods in your diet typically. But if you don't want to get lab testing done or it's not accessible, should you just take a zinc supplement anyway? And to that, I would say, Probably not, because zinc over supplementation can actually cause a copper deficiency. Even when somebody is zinc deficient, typically only a short course of zinc supplementation is recommended for that exact reason. And now moving on to the last supplement in the mineral category, and that's magnesium. Magnesium has a lot of different functions in the body, one of which is that it is involved in neurotransmitter regulation. Magnesium insufficiency has also been implicated in a lot of psychological conditions. As with the research done on zinc, most studies looking at magnesium supplementation and ADHD aren't looking at magnesium supplementation alone. It's magnesium supplementation in conjunction with a lot of other nutrients such as zinc and omega-3. There is some research that shows that kiddos who have ADHD might be more likely to have low levels of magnesium and that bringing those levels back up might be beneficial for ADHD symptoms. Are you starting to see a trend here? <laughs> so coming back to the same question I asked for zinc and iron, if you have ADHD, is it smart to just take magnesium just in case? And to break from the trend, it's actually probably safe in this case for most people to take a little extra magnesium just to make sure you have your bases covered than it would be for some of the other nutrients. So long as the magnesium supplementation is modest and not a crazy mega dose, the only side effect that you may encounter is diarrhea. But there absolutely are some conditions such as kidney disease where magnesium supplement may not be safe, so always check with your doctor. Alrighty friends, let's move on to the next category of nutrient supplementation, and that is amino acid supplementation. First up, we have phenylalanine. Phenylalanine is a precursor to dopamine, and so the theory is that if you were to increase the amount of phenylalanine in circulation, you may increase the amount of dopamine that you can produce. This hypothesis was investigated in the 80s, and there hasn't been a lot of movement on it since then. This study done in adults with ADHD showed that there was a very small short-term benefit with phenylalanine supplementation, but that benefit only really lasted about two weeks before symptoms returned to baseline. And so it was hypothesized that there could be a very short-term benefit, but that the body very quickly builds up a tolerance. This hypothesis was also tested in children around the same time, and that study showed that there was no benefit to phenylalanine supplementation. The next amino acid supplement that I see circulating around the internet is tyrosine. This one is very closely related to phenylalanine because before phenylalanine turns into dopamine, it has to first be converted to tyrosine. And so the justification for supplementing is exactly the same. The more of the precursors you have, the more of the dopamine you might end up with. But the research on tyrosine supplementation was almost exactly the same as the research on phenylalanine supplementation, and that there is a very short-term benefit that tends to go away if you supplement for a longer period of time. And as with phenylalanine, that short-term benefit was only seen in the research done in adults, and there was no benefit shown when that supplementation was provided to children. And so based on the available evidence, it's pretty safe to say that supplementing phenylalanine and tyrosine are both probably a waste of time. Next up, we have theanine. Theanine is a non-essential amino acid that is typically found in green and black tea. And in conjunction with caffeine is why green and black tea can give you a quick short-term boost in cognitive function. There was a systematic review published in 2021 summarizing the four studies that look into the potential of theanine supplementation for boosting cognitive function. In these studies, participants were provided with around 200 milligrams of theanine, which is the equivalent of about eight cups of black tea. And that was either provided alone or in conjunction with caffeine. And what these studies showed is that both theanine and caffeine when provided alone result in improvements in certain aspects of cognition, such as distractibility, task completion accuracy, and reaction time. And that benefits in these domains are even more enhanced when caffeine and theanine are provided together. However, there are some major limitations to this body of research. The first is that all four of these studies have very small sample sizes. The second one is that of the four studies, only one of them was actually done in people with ADHD. And that study only had a sample size of five. 
And the third one is that the study done on ADHD was not blinded. So the people who were evaluating these children's behavior knew what they were taking. Additionally, there was no standardization on when the kids in that particular study had last eaten, which can have a huge impact on cognitive function in children, because if they're hungry, they're gonna be a lot more distractible. So overall, while there is some evidence that theanine supplementation can be beneficial for certain aspects of focus and cognition, the body of research overall is pretty small and it's largely not done in people with ADHD specifically. It's possible that theanine could help and it might even be a promising avenue for future research. But as it stands right now, the statement that theanine is helpful for ADHD symptom management, well, that would not be an evidence-based statement. On to our last amino acid supplement, and that is NAC, or N-acetylcysteine. And the theory behind why this might work is that NAC can help regulate glutamate levels. And there are some studies that show that glutamate levels in the brain may be altered in people who have ADHD. However, it's important to note that both higher and lower levels of glutamate have been observed in this population. NAC supplementation has also been a therapeutic research target for a number of other psychiatric conditions, such as bipolar, schizophrenia, and OCD. But there hasn't really been that much research on ADHD specifically. I was able to find one study that showed that NAC supplementation did help improve ADHD symptoms. However, those results are not generalizable to the wider audience because this study was specifically looking at a population of people with an autoimmune condition that affects glutamate levels in the brain. So unless you have ADHD and that particular autoimmune condition, there is absolutely no evidence to support NAC supplementation. And given that glutamate levels have been shown to be either high or low in people with ADHD, I personally wouldn't be gung-ho about giving this a try just for funsies. Now, before I dive into the last category of nutrient supplements, I want to say that this is not a full list. There is also a whole host of herbal supplements and lifestyle interventions floating around the interwebs. And I plan on doing a breakdown of the herbal supplements next, so if you're interested in seeing that, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out. Moving into our last category, and that is miscellaneous vitamin supplements. First up, we have choline. So where does this one come from? There is a hypothesis that dysfunction in the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in the brain are a piece of this whole ADHD puzzle. And choline is a precursor to acetylcholine that would interact with that receptor. So the thought is that if acetylcholine isn't being effectively used as a neurotransmitter because of this dysfunction, that taking more choline and thereby increasing the amount of acetylcholine in circulation may be beneficial in overcoming this gap in function. However, it's important to note that most of the research being done on this hypothesis is not focused on the acetylcholine part of that receptor, but rather the nicotinic part of that receptor. And there are some drugs currently in development that are focusing on this particular system. Overall, there are no randomized control trials showing that healthy people or people over the age of five will get any benefit in ADHD symptoms from taking a choline supplement. But there are a couple of places where we do see beneficial effects of choline supplementation. The first population that's been shown to benefit from choline supplementation are kiddos with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and ADHD. There was a randomized control trial that showed that kids that fall into this category who were given choline between the ages of two and a half and five scored higher on several markers of executive function as they got older. However, another study showed that when the supplementation is given later in life, so past the age of five, that there is no benefit. It has also been theorized that low maternal intake of choline may increase the risk of ADHD development in the offspring, but this appears to be largely theoretical with various papers throwing out the hypothesis and not actually testing it directly. I actually couldn't find any studies looking at choline provision during pregnancy and ADHD risk in the children later in life. There was one study that showed that maternal choline supplementation can lead to better attention in seven-year-olds. However, the sample size of this was very small and it was funded by the USDA, a choline supplement company, and the egg board. And additionally, they were looking at attention rather than whether or not a child received an ADHD diagnosis. So overall, when it comes to choline supplementation, there's not really any evidence that it's going to be beneficial for ADHD symptoms unless you are a two and a half to five year old who has ADHD and also fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And despite the fact that there is no evidence to support the idea that supplementing choline in pregnancy will help prevent ADHD later, choline is still a very important nutrient during pregnancy and is really important for fetal brain development. And so taking a supplement during pregnancy may not be a bad idea if your particular diet pattern tends to be lower in choline. Next up, we have omega-3, which is probably one of the most commonly recommended supplement for people with ADHD. Now, the idea behind why this works is because there is a theory that ADHD symptoms are related to inflammation and omega-3 fatty acids are anti-inflammatory. 
Additionally, it's been hypothesized that having more omega-3 fatty acids embedded into the cell membranes may affect dopamine and serotonin neurotransmission in the brain. There is also some evidence that suggests that children with ADHD may have lower levels of essential fatty acids than neurotypical children. Some early open label studies show that children with low levels of essential fatty acids, so low levels of omega-3 in their blood, may see ADHD symptoms improve when they're provided with a supplement and those levels rise. However, it's important to note that in studies done in children, most assessments are done by teachers and parents. And if the teachers and parents know that the kid is taking a supplement, they may be more likely to report improvements in behavior which is why blinding and having a placebo group is really important for this sort of research. Now, beyond these open label studies, there have now actually been a number of randomized control trials, which have largely failed to demonstrate that there is a benefit to omega-3 supplementation. Now, this meta-analysis done in 2011 concluded that there is a small but statistically significant benefit in omega-3 supplementation. However, the studies being reviewed in that study were also covered in an earlier study done in 2009, which came to a different conclusion because they noted that most of the studies on this topic were not actually being done in kids with an ADHD diagnosis. Rather, they were being done in children with different developmental delays or other learning disabilities, or they were being done in kids with ADHD symptoms, but no actual diagnosis. Additionally, several of the studies that reported a benefit only actually saw the benefit in a very small fraction of the domains that were being investigated. Since then, this 2018 meta-analysis of six studies showed a very small non-statistically significant improvement in symptoms. And this 2023 meta-analysis of 22 studies showed no overall benefit, but that there might be a small benefit for people specifically who are supplementing for longer than four months. I couldn't find the full text of this one, so I'm not really sure how this analysis was conducted. Zooming in on the specific studies, there are several randomized control trials done in the last few years that have showed that there is no benefit to taking omega-3 supplements for people with ADHD. But if I'm looking to flesh out my listicle on different supplements that help ADHD, or I'm looking to push a specific product, product or narrative, I could just pick a study that showed the specific benefit that I'm trying to promote, gloss over the context and specifics of that study, completely ignore the wider body of research that shows that there's no benefit, and call that statement evidence-based. So overall, will omega-3 supplementation help your ADHD? Probably not, especially if you didn't have low levels to begin with. But there may be other reasons why you might want to supplement with omega-3 outside of the ADHD benefits. And last but not least, we have vitamin D. Now the idea behind why this works is because vitamin D is really important for the expression of an enzyme called tyrosine hydroxylase, which is the rate limiting enzyme necessary for dopamine synthesis. Now there's a good amount of evidence showing that kiddos with ADHD are more likely to have lower vitamin D levels. However, the research shows that the difference in vitamin D levels is probably only by six points. And while that difference is statistically significant, it is not clinically significant. What are you doing? 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 Okay. Thanks. However, it does appear to be the case that kids who are vitamin D deficient or those whose mothers didn't get enough vitamin D during pregnancy may be at a higher risk of developing ADHD. However, a major limitation with research looking into this association is that by and large, they didn't control for very relevant confounding factors, such as the time of year the vitamin D lab was taken, the nationality of the participants included in the analysis, and various maternal demographics, such as education level, income, smoking status, etc. But that's all looking at whether or not vitamin vitamin D status is associated with the development of ADHD. What does the research show when it comes to vitamin D supplementation and ADHD symptom severity? There are a few studies looking into this that show that when a kid has vitamin D deficiency and they take vitamin D in conjunction with Ritalin therapy, that they might get a small additional benefit in symptom reduction. But as this meta-analysis points out, these studies done on this particular topic are pretty low quality due to certain aspects of the methodology being unclear and also the way that results are reported. So as it stands right now, the research supporting the idea that vitamin D supplementation can help with ADHD symptoms is there, but it's also far from robust or definitive and seems to only be beneficial if you have low vitamin D levels to begin with. And regardless, if either you or your kiddo has low vitamin D, you probably want to fix that whether or not there's a benefit to your ADHD symptoms. So putting this all together, the only nutrient supplements that seem to be effective for ADHD symptom reduction are the ones that you're taking to correct a nutrient deficiency. So if you have ADHD symptoms or you have an ADHD diagnosis, it might be worth getting a little bit of lab work done to see whether or not specific targeted supplementation might be helpful. And aside from these cases, the only supplement that 
might help a little bit in a limited sense with attention is probably theanine, but there just isn't enough good evidence to support the widespread recommendation for its use. Well, that's all I've got for you today. If you really like these research heavy deep dives, definitely check out the breakdown I did on collagen supplementation up next. It's a good one, I promise.